Hey guys, Henning and Morten from Flip Normals here. And in this video, we have a free excerpt of our newly released tutorial, Sculpting Female Faces. Which is on sale as it's Black Friday this week. That is also true, yeah. it's 50% off along with most of our other products in our entire catalog. So if you have any, any of our products you've been looking at, like the Creature Kate lighting scenes, they're currently 50% off yeah. for the next few days or so. So definitely check those out as well. This tutorial is about sculpting a female face from start to end. Um, you start up with a sphere and at the end of this we have a fully formed face. So we've included chapter 2 here as a free excerpt for you here on YouTube where we just establish some of the more important features on the face and hopefully this will give you a good understanding of what's to come in the full tutorial. Alright, second chapter. Second chapter. In this one we are going to be refining that we're establishing the, the features a little bit more and going into a little more detail just to you sort of just start to work up parts of the character. You know, we don't want to go, go too far yet because taking it slow and making sure that we don't um, add things that are unnecessary, add things that we don't get attached to yet. There's still, there's a lot of looking at reference. Um, I use pure ref for that. So again, you know, we're not displaying it here in the in the video because I think it could be quite distracting sometimes <laughs> because it takes up like half the screen. But it's nice to have pure ref on because you can keep it on top. So it's always on top and I keep it in ZBrush. This way I don't have to keep it on a second monitor. Um, I don't have to turn my head to look at reference. So I would definitely recommend getting pure ref. It sounds like the laziest thing in the world. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing the same when I'm talking about pure ref that it's just it actually on the screen right now, it's just overlaid. You just aren't able to see it because of the capture, but it, it really is. You don't have to move your head. Yeah. You move your eye like a little bit, but moving your head, it's not like it's a lot of work. It's, it's more that whenever by the time you move your head you already lost some information yeah because visual information that's like that's fresh in your mind yeah but now you can basically have by having an overlay you can basically have two things in your mind at the same time mm. so it's not that you were super lazy and we can't look at two things two th we can't look have we can't move our head <laughs> <laughs> it's purely that it's just more intuitive so from here you know i from the last chapter to this chapter we took a little break and I think it's nice to take breaks in between your sculpting sessions just because it allows you to reflect a little bit. You go out, look at some more reference. Uh, you maybe do a little paint over um, just to, just because paint overs are nice. They're easy to do. Um, they're sort of non-committal. You don't have to do anything crazy to your sculpt, but it allows you to experiment and figure out what's missing or what is wrong with your sculpt. Um, so that's, that's a technique I, I've used a lot and... You know, for this, I I realized that my skull shape needed to be worked up a little bit more. The uh, the placement of the neck, uh, the jaw in particular, it was too soft. I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be a manly superhero jaw, but I do want some definition to it. I'll go in and and later I'll add a little bit more fat to soften it up. But it's again just altering the skull shape a little bit because we we can at this point. We're not committed to anything specific right now it is it is also interesting with the the changes we're doing now because do they make it better i mean maybe it makes it more closer to the vision of the sculpt which mm -hmm. might be this uh this beautiful woman but if you're going for a, if you're going for a, for a specific person what you know like the, this this jaw here is far stronger than most people's jaws yeah. you know like if you have a uh, if you have a smaller jaw or less defined jaw it's not the jaw which was there before wasn't worse. It's just different. Yeah, it's a different, different jaw. So it's. I think it's important to 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 recognize that there's such a thing as the perfect face. Like no, there. Th we keep talking about individual variation, and that's because there really is so much individual variation. There are some common truths, like people have a jaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, then the variation is is the shape of it. A little bit of tweaking on the nose. The nose, like I said, because it started out with more, I had more um, black women for reference. So it started out more sort of like this African nose. Um, I s decided to slim it down a little more. Um, and here we're also going to go in at the, at the ear in a little bit, which because at this point, you know, we've, we have established 
the the major forms, the, the major landmarks. You see here we're indicating the the zygomatic and how it sort of plays with the with the cheek. You can get this puckered look by removing some of the form underneath the zygomatic and underneath the cheek. Kind of like if you if you suck your cheeks in, you know that that's that kind of Instagram look. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> It is kind of interesting with that actually, like yeah, what you mentioned, is sucking in your cheeks, because that's that's when you when you do that kind of stuff and you and you touch your face or whatnot. That's when you realize what stuff is fat, what stuff is is bone. Because yeah. if if you if you were to suck it in, in your cheeks, you would one area would deform and one area really would not, yeah. unless there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> so I, I I do that as well. Like it's it looks a bit weird <laughs> when you're sculpting. You're just pointing your fingers at your face and going. Boop. Yeah, what does it feel like? <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel like? But if you put it on in the middle of your cheek versus slightly above it, you know, one part is really soft and one part is really hard. And I think that's important to describe in your sculpt as well. This angle is also important. And you'll see me go back to this angle a lot, the three-quarter angle. Um, it's sort of like straight on three quarters because it allows you to evaluate the, the shape of the cheek and, you know, the shape. How does the cheek go down to the chin you always have this sort of angle that goes down there and i think that's a very important a very important angle to look at it's a mild indication of the sternocleidomastoid not too much because i want to keep it soft and then here it's like working up the jaw to figure out okay where is the exact placement of the ear you can see i use the old transpose line to sort of um, it's just to have an indication. It's just like I'm drawing out a virtual line that's not like on my model anywhere. Yeah, the transpose lines are, are amazing for this. Yeah. You can use it for tons of measuring stuff as well. What you can also do with this is you can just have side view reference of whatever it is you're doing and just lower the opacity of zebra. So mm. like you have a slider all the way in the top right, which you can you can do, and just straight up just just line it up. Yeah, it's a good tip. But you know whatever works for you. This is more like a traditional way of sculpting. Uh, yeah, but if you if you are doing likeness, then you're basically gonna have to do uh, like like actually match it up. So here, the way the ear sits. So there's some general rules for the ear, like we talked about. Um, most generic ears <laughs> tend to follow, you know, the bottom of the brow, bottom of the nose, for the top and the bottom of the of the ear. Uh, this ear I will place a little lower because that's what I had on my reference, and I thought that was interesting to try to play with. It generally sits back at at an angle, I, I don't know, like maybe 15 or 20 degrees, sort of like tilted back. Um, and it follows the, it follows sort of like the line of the jaw. So where your jaw ends, goes up into the ear. This is again one of these things which is kind of resolved if you know the skull. Because yeah. in, in the skull, there is a hole for the ear. Like the ear isn't just there as an external organ, which looks very pretty. It's... It's there as a very specific feature. And if you look at the skull, the ear hole is approximately, well, what, where the ear is. Now, if I was doing this not for a tutorial, um, not to shill our own products, but <laughs> I would totally use our creature kit just because, uh, how many ears do we have in that? Like 15 or yeah. so, 10, 15. Or if you have an ear that you've already modeled, you know, attach it with Dynamesh and just sort of like Dynamesh it on. Because, yeah. I mean, personally for me, ears is like, yeah, it's an important feature, but it's not something that I, I want to always have to spend time on. No. So if I want to get a quick sculpt out, I'll use a pre-existing ear. Yeah, it's it's one of these that, yes, there is individual variation, but the individual variation is more proportion. It's They all have the same structure for it. Yeah. When it comes to when it comes to the eyes, there is so much more personality in the eyes. You can have a single picture of an eye and get a million likes on Instagram because there is so <laughs> much. Like It's it's like, you know, the, um, the Afghan girl from National Geographic from mm. the 80s or whatnot, yeah, like yeah. these beautiful, what is it, green eyes or whatever. And you don't have that with ears. You wouldn't have a single shot of an ear. Ears just honestly aren't that interesting yeah they're maybe, interesting maybe, maybe some people find it I yeah don't know, but, maybe you know does yeah. nothing for me <laughs> and they're interesting from like a purely from per shape point of view because there's a lot of crazy shit happening there but in terms of like personality you know like you can't flex your your ear you can't have a sad or a happy ear so like Morton is saying as well like whenever i'm doing ears i just steal it from my <laughs> old model the interesting part about ears you know is like some people's ears tend to 
go out a lot. You know, they have these like Dumbo kind yes. of ears <laughs> where the helix protrudes out the most. Some people have the inside part, the anti-helix protrudes the most. And, you know, some people have very crinkled ears, some have very soft, some have the lobe attached, some have not. Um, I find that a more an attached lobe is is cuter for women. Mm. I don't know if it's a personal thing, but that's something that I've noticed. So usually I'll go between sort of like more attached, a more attached and a little less attached for for when sculpting women. I don't know if there's any truth to that statement whatsoever. <laughs> so don't use that as fact. Uh, that's just something I've experienced. It's one of Morton's many half truths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Approximate knowledge of many things. <laughs> And this part is actually quite tricky to get right. I see that a lot when people try to integrate the neck with um, with the shoulders or the traps. Is this transition between neck and shoulder? And the only way I found to make it and to describe how to do it is to like is to work up the trap. You have to know the anatomy of the traps in order to place the neck correctly um, on the rest of the body. Otherwise, you tend to have this weird. A neck that tapers from the top to the bottom that just flows into the body like it's a weird like it's almost like you just extruded it from everywhere um and it tends to look a little weird so even if it's a woman uh, you still want to go in and define the traps to a certain extent and define the little you have this little gap i can't remember what it's called but you have this little gap between the neck and the traps where there's like this tri- triangular fossa maybe um that part keeping that part flat sort of helps to integrate the neck um, with the traps. Yeah, it's one of these, again, you don't want it to be, you don't want it to be non-defined, because non-defined no. would just mean it's like this soft, undefined transition. There. <laughs> Blob. But you don't want it to be too defined, because you, then, then it looks like, then it looks like a, like a weightlifter or something, yeah. which might not be what you want, but you want it to be soft. Yeah. Which is, Again, it's a tricky one, but that's where there is some shape of it. There is some clear indication of it. It's not ambiguous, but it's also not strong. No. It's just, it's it's clearly there to, in a deliberate fashion, but it's it's just a hint of it. Yeah. And all of these things are things that will be refined throughout the, throughout the series. Yeah. So, you know... You will see us go in and tweak the neck more, tweak the ear position more, proportions between eye, nose, and, and mouth. You know, it's that's the wonderful thing about digital sculpting, is that you can go in and, and tweak these things. So here's the psychomatic. Um, you know, very defined at this point. It's um I'm trying to trying to figure out how far do I want I the, the psychomatics are like the widest point on your on your face there. It's like it sticks out. And for some people, it's very defined. You know, you'll you'll definitely have this where uh, women with contouring they try to emphasize the zygomatic. You know, they want that to be more defined. It gives you more of that sexy look, mm. if you will. Um, but and and a way to to do that, just from a makeup point of view, uh, if you're not just doing pure shape, is to um, change how the light looks on your face. This is a side note. This is something I like to do once in a while, just to see where did I come from? Like, have I improved it up until now? If not, I'll go back and I'll start over from that point where I feel like it's not improved. Um, at this point, I'm lucky. It's like, oh, yes. Okay, I think it looks better now. <laughs> so, uh, but it's nice to see what you've done. It's a, it's a great, it's great to have undo history enabled for this because it, it allows you to experiment a lot more easily. You don't, you don't have to be as committed to what you're doing um, because you you have this undo stack and even if you save if you save as a project which is what i'm doing for this uh, i can close it come back to it in a few days and i can still go through my undo history to see if if i'm satisfied with where i am yeah, the undo history is super nice for it and like we said like you shouldn't get attached to anything at this point and particularly when you're dealing with so many subtle subtleties like this, it's so easy to go too crazy on it. Yeah. And yeah, in, in this case, it, uh, you know, you've been working it up pretty methodically and in a proper way, but it's so easy just to lose track of that. Yeah. And just go crazy. And, uh, I think one thing that, that, um, helps you avoid that as well is jump around. You know, I'll, I'll never stay in one spot for too long. I work on the ear. And then I work on the nose, go to the mouth, 
and you know the, the eyes just you know jump all the way around just yeah. to figure out okay what about this part now what about this part now so it, it's never something that you want to avoid that problem of detailing something too much and that way everything just kind of improves at the same speed well i i, I only do the opposite of what you said here where you define a specific specific area i only do that when i'm, I'm detailing something up yeah like you have 10 million polys and uh, that's exactly what i'm doing on the personal project which we're probably going to show at some point in some videos where you know you, you need a crazy detailed lip and it's of an older character as well where you know you just you just isolate the mouth and you spend two hours on that but if you do that at this point you can't do that because the mouth isn't resolved the volume isn't there and you know there's you you can't you can't do that yeah yeah that's you know um something that i was struggling with in this throughout this series was specifically her mouth um i i wasn't i never had a specific mouth in mind but i had such a hard time finding a mouth that i felt um represented the character so I went back and forth between many different kinds of mouths. Uh, so in the the first mouth here is more based on sort of like a mixed mixed race woman. Um so more uh, kind of like if you think is, is this is the case with with more African or Asian features when it comes to the mouth is that the barrel of the mouth tends to be more defined. You have more volume sort of like that sticks out from from the bottom of the nose until the the top of the chin it's sort of like it sticks out a lot more whereas in if you have a caucasian uh, reference man or woman doesn't matter tend to be uh, a little more flat it's been a, it's been a bit annoying actually when whenever you're talking about the difference between the different the different uh, human races here is that there might be some backlash calling you <laughs> like calling you a racist for, <laughs> oh, for yeah. just acknowledging that there are there are structural differences between them. Very very clear structural differences. Uh, there is, I mean, nobody would say that they look the same. No. Like if you if you're looking at a, at a beautiful African woman, you wouldn't assume that you wouldn't say that she looks the same as a Swiss girl. No. Like it's clearly there are differences in them. You're racist if you're saying that one is better than the other <laughs> yeah but acknowledging that there are differences is I you mean, know you'll have like for 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 um african men and women you will have a tend to have a more elongated skull towards the back for asian men and women it, the, the eye socket will be pushed forward a lot mm. more and you know like i said with with caucasian people the the barrel of the mouth area tends to be retracted a little more compared to the other two so there are just you know fundamental differences that you have to look for yeah. and you have to find to to figure this out like try to search for reference of skull shapes of different people yeah. and i think you'll be quite surprised in in the difference um, that there actually is you can't you can't do a sculpt of you know, a Mongol, but you're using references of, I don't know, Charlize Theron or something, no. you know, that's not going to work. No. So you have to find the appropriate reference for this kind of thing. And you have to accept that there are, uh, there are, you know, there are differences in the way that, that we are built up shape wise. The differences between the different races are not a hue shift. It's not a hue and no. saturation one where you take a you take somebody and you just shift it towards a different color. There are fundamental differences here. Yeah. Yeah, you also read up on this when it came to ethnicity versus race, because somebody said, oh it's not it's called it's called ethnicity and not race. Well but it seems like race is totally the correct word to use here well ethnicity was more culture and race mm -hmm. is more to do with i mean if you're if you have a thick brow or whatnot it's nothing to do with your culture no. that is a pure <laughs> biological thing <laughs> yeah yeah for me it's like as long as i can express uh, you know what i i want to get across in terms of of the shape and form um i i don't really think about it that much i just want to i just want to in my sculpt, I want to be able to communicate it as clearly as possible. Yeah. And, and when we're teaching like this, um, in any way that I can communicate it to 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 you guys, that's that's what's important to me. Yeah. So 
up until this point, you know, it's again, it's a slow and steady progress with just small refinements here and there. Now, after the, the, the ear was established, it went back, did the features a little bit more, tried to define them in a way that, okay, this is how I think I want the, the, the person to look like. And now I'm finally giving the ears a little bit of love. And you can see the hole you just added in there for that. That's where the hole is in the skull as well. Yeah. It's not just a random place. So it's the way you could do this as well. It's not that that's right or wrong is that, you know, you could, you could just do the skull first and just really emphasize that hole. Mm. And then there is just, there is absolutely no ambiguity as to where the ear is. Yeah. Then you could add the ear around it, for yeah, example. Exactly. Um, yeah, this is this is how I like to add an ear, just in at a slab of boop right there. There's an <laughs> ear, and then I start to cut into it. But again, like also even even the ear, you know, the shape of the ear, um, how big, how small it is, that also affects your your character, you know, because it says a lot about your character. If you had a, if she has a chewed up ear, you know. Why would she have a chewed up ear? Yeah. Maybe she was a gang member at some point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and you have that with uh, if you if you're doing if you're doing martial art and you're seeing there's a dude with like really fucked up ears. Yeah, like he's just been punched a lot in the ear, and you have was it like the cauliflower ear? Yeah, like, you see that a lot with boxers. Yeah, yeah, all the boxers just yeah. like destroyed ears. Yeah, it's just all the cartilage and scarring after you know repeated blows to the ears just start to to build up. It's kind of like if you've been stung by a bee, but you got stung by a bee every day. <laughs> yeah, it's permanent bee stung. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. The thing here about the ear is this is a note. Um, the way that it sits, I can't remember what is it called. The like little two split fork that goes up there. The anti helix. Yeah, probably maybe. It like it tends to go underneath the outer rim of the the, the ear so mm. it's like there's actually a deep sort of like cavity or space if you like if you put your finger in your ear and you like go all the way around the inside of the ear you can kind of feel how the shape of the ear is um, i would recommend that you do that just to get a better understanding of the ear because whenever i'm sculpting ears i'm always just touching my own ears because yeah. it's it's such a good reference. Yeah. One of the things you'll realize then is uh, is what part are the fatty pads? Like yeah. the lobe is more fatty, and then the rest is cartilage, and just how thin the ear is. If you, uh, it's very thin. Yeah. It's very thin. Like it's, it, it's you're talking about a few millimeters, and that's why if you look at all the CG renders of humans, it's all like subsurface scattering in the ear, and there is a reason that subsurface scattering in the ear when it comes to strong strong backlight, and not and not the skull because. The light just travels through the ear and scatters in it. Yeah. One thing that's also important to note is um, the back of the ear. You know, yeah, you might not see it a lot, but you will see it sometimes. And especially if you have something with subsurface scattering, the back of the ear needs to have a... So, like, I I, I think about it as a cylinder. With the, so, you have the ear, then there's a cylinder attached to the ear, and then that cylinder gets attached to the head. Because mm. you have this weird, like ball or like cylinder shape how the ear gets attached it's a tricky shape to get right but i think it's important to at least acknowledge that it's there we talked about this in our observation video that you can basically sculpt the same person for like a year every single day <laughs> and every single time you're going to learn something new about that person because there is just there's so much complexity in a human it's not that you're sculpting this once and then now you're done there is Every single time you're going to notice a new little plane change or a new little detail here and there. It's, um, it's what Morton just mentioned with the, like the cylinder at the back of the ear. You are not going to notice that until you've been sculpting like a like no. hundred people. <laughs> That's like a very secondary thing you notice. If this is your first sculpt, you, you're just going to be noticing, oh shit, there's a skull. Like you haven't thought about the fact there is a skull there before. And then you can start to go into all the different things. Are, oh, there is an ear hole. You know, you have, this is the specific shape of the nostrils, how the structure of it. Yeah. But try to take in, try to take in, you know, one thing at a time. Again, here with the transpose lines, I'm trying to measure out where, so I, I use the nose as an indication for a lot of things. So I, I establish the width of the nose because that's that's kind of easy. And then usually, 
if you're looking at Loomis references or something like that, I think it'll be something like the the corner of the eye tends to terminate at the at the outside of the nose. But for many references that I look at, the eye tends to go a little beyond the nose. And it's the same way of measuring out the mouth. I think the mouth is traditionally supposed to end at the center of your, your eyeball. Yeah. You know, if you're looking at uh, the kind of stylized drawing references. But for this one, I wanted to make the mouth a little wider. So it's it's good to know these just so you can know, okay, here's a general rule for it. And how do I adapt this to my sculpture? It's it's so that you get an, a general ballpark of yeah, how stuff yeah. works. But don't use them as the end result. Use them as a starting point. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's annoying when you, you're posting this kind of stuff online and somebody's like, well, actually, if you measure it based on this and then you show the picture of the reference and and you're like, yeah, but it doesn't matter what Loomis said in the 50s <laughs> in, his, in, his, in his books. You know, that's a generalization of, of many people. So. Yeah. An interesting conversation I had with my girlfriend about the skull was in regards to the brow, how the brow connects to the the eyelids. Because if you Google hooded hooded eyelids, that's what most people have. Sort of like you have a thicker, fattier brow that tends to sag down uh, a little bit on your on your eyelid. We've talked about this before in other sculpting videos. Like mine is very pronounced. Some people have less pronounced hooded eyelids, and some people like share have no hooded eyelids. Hmm. She kind of looks like a skeleton. It's a little creepy sometimes, but I wanted to try and implement some of that into this because I thought it was an interesting look. It tends to look a little different from someone who has hooded eyelids just because that that tends to be the norm. And if you don't know what the hell we're talking about, just Google hooded eyelids. Yeah, I did. I didn't know before this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I knew they existed, but I didn't know that was that could be such a big difference. And if you're looking at someone like Cher, that's probably because she has 40 years of plastic surgery on her. Yeah, that's also that. Just a quick tip here for um, for a more feminine look. I know we're not there yet in terms of a feminine look. But underneath the eye, you can see this, this woman, she hasn't slept for 60 years. <laughs> but um, adding a little bit of volume down there gives you that cute, tired look. Mm. <laughs> and then adding volume below that, so you have more volume on the cheek tends to produce a more childlike or feminine look. If you take away that volume, um, so basically you're taking away something that's a little bit fatty on top of the skull, tends to produce a more masculine look for you. So, you know, if you're doing a man instead, just go in, like, it's basically like you take your hand and you just wipe down. Mm. Um, there are so many of these subtle differences that you only really start to notice once you once you sculpt both genders and you got to sculpt a lot yeah you have to sculpt this, a lot. this just takes time every single time you sculpt one of these characters your eye gets more refined like it's not i'm talking about the character size but like your artistic eye yeah what you you're what you're able to per- perceived you know you get more granular every single time it's like when when i'm drinking wine i'm just like mm, it's probably red <laughs> <laughs> but then you have an expert who's like well there is a hint of chamomile and sewage in it but, <laughs> but uh, like I, I literally can't perceive that maybe they're maybe they're bullshitting but uh but like I, I i just can't perceive that but every single time you might notice something new yeah. in, in it like whether it's your sense of smell or eye or taste or your vision or whatever it is your senses can be more refined yeah and your sculpts are just gonna get better better and better every single time if you keep at it yeah Another thing, a quick thing here that you'll notice is, so these are just placeholder eyes for now, but making the pupil bigger, again, is um, something that can add to the feminine look, can also make it more cute, um, and obviously it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it your sculpt and character look a little younger as well. 